John Hankey, what's your perspective on this? <laughs> Let's see if we can get online. Um, <clears throat> look, I mean, um, the Internet really didn't exist uh, 15 years ago. Uh, there were some 400 servers connected to the Internet in 1989. There are 480 million servers connected to the Internet today. Going back to Google's birth, you know, just 10 years ago, there were 150 million total users of the Internet. Today there are 1.5 billion, you know, approaching a quarter of the world's population wired together. Um, so it's this connectedness and sharing of information that I'm optimistic about because I think that gives us a tool to monitor what's happening, to understand the situation that we're in, to understand that we're all in it together um, in a very broad way. I mean, literally billions of people can understand where we are. We've never had that opportunity to have a shared vision like that in the history of the human species. And then to use that knowledge to act, to put pressure on our political leaders, our business leaders, to do the things that we need to do to change the situation that we're in and to monitor it. And if it's not happening fast enough, which may be the case, to push to make it happen even faster. So Google Earth, I think, may, be, may play some small role in that. I'm not, I'm not here to really um, you know, promote that or, or whatever. But I, but I think it is a useful tool for people to um, get an idea of what's happening on the planet. So um, you know, you've probably used the application at this point. Over 400 million people now have it installed in their computer. So almost a, f a fourth of all computers have a copy of Google Earth on it. Uh, it lets us go. Um, pretty much wherever we want in the world, uh, traveling here to the Grand Canyon. Uh, we can go down into the Grand Canyon if we like. But um, as was mentioned in the introduction, you know, the thing that um, has completely shocked me is the way that um, this tool, and it was conceived as a really simple tool, has been used, and it's been used for some really noble purposes. We're looking here um, at a mining operation in West Virginia, and it's kind of off the beaten path. Um, it was, uh, that's sort of by design. The companies that do this type of mining um, haven't, you know, been that thrilled about people really seeing what's happening. And Google Earth gives us the ability to really drill in and see, you know, this highly destructive activity. We can, for the first time, watch. And once we can watch and know, then we can begin to act. And the company that created this layer um, and published it, um, you know, is an activist organization. They want to get this message out there so that pressure can be applied to policymakers to do things differently. One of the things they point out, you know, very graphically here is there are um, about four and a half billion gallons of toxic mining sludge in this uh, reservoir here held back by this earthen dam. And if we pivot around, we can get an idea of kind of what's going on here. There's a little valley here where people live, and there's an elementary school down here. So, um, you know, the tool, I think, is an excellent way to kind of communicate, communicate the gravity um, of what's happening. Um, and um, that's something that is, is global in nature. Let, let's jump over to um, Africa quickly. So um, this was something that was put together with the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., and um, you know, I thought it was a phenomenally um, powerful use of the tool. So you, know, you all, being you know, educated citizens reading the newspapers, um, are aware probably of what's happened in Darfur. Many people maybe weren't so aware. And um, this layer in Google Earth, again, it's out there. It's in a lot of schools. A lot of kids play around with it. My son plays around with Google Earth. He thinks it's almost like a video game. But we sort of sneak in some of these layers to help educate people. Uh, in this case, each of these little flame icons is showing a village that was burnt. Uh, you can actually zoom in with the satellite imagery to the point where you can see these villages. You can connect that, you know, this is, these are people. They live in, in little towns, not um, all that different than the way that we live. And... Um, we can see, you know, real photos of what kind of devastation happened there. Uh, a use that, you know, personally, um, I never expected. Another great use uh, was by the UN um, UN Environmental uh, Organization. Uh, they published this great book. It's this huge coffee table book. Uh, it's glorious. It shows satellite images of all of these environmentally active areas around the world where sort of very significant changes taking place. Unfortunately, the book costs about $50 per copy to print, and they have to sell it, and they distribute some number, some hundreds of free copies around the world. But it's not a very effective way to really get this message out to you know, the millions of people that could benefit from it. So they sort of moved all of that online and now published this layer um, in Earth. And this is Lake Chad. And so um, with this, uh, 
if my internet connection is, is going to stay with me here. Um, this is um, the uh, current state, but we can actually go all the way back to 1963, courtesy of, this is actually declassified U.S. spy satellite photography. This was from the Corona satellite um, that was uh, flown in the 1960s. So you can see at that point there was this very extensive body of water, and uh, use and climate change has reduced it to what we see here today. Um, there are lots and lots of places uh, where that kind of significant environmental change is happening. Every one of these little um, blue icons um, displays one of them in the, way that, uh, the, in the way that I just showed you. Another organization, Greenpeace, um, has been using Google Earth uh, in a little, more, you know, a little more of aggressive tone to get messages out about things that they consider important. And um, you can actually embed video right within the product. And so in this case, they're talking about deforestation in the Congo. Uh, again, it's just sort of slipped into this product that um, people are using you know, around the world for fun and for trip planning and so on. But we're hoping that some of them discover um, some of this information that I think is pretty significant. Um, just a couple of other uh, quick examples over in Papua New Guinea. Uh, we can zoom down. You guys have probably heard about palm oil, uh, biofuel highly destructive uh, when these companies go in and knock down virgin rainforest in order to cultivate it. This is just one example of that, Starting, startlingly clear uh, from space. Uh, move over to another continent. Uh, we can go down to Brazil. Um, this particular area here is governed uh, by this guy, uh, Chief Sari. He's got his sort of tribal paint and headdress on. He's actually a college-educated fellow who went back to his tribal land to try to protect it uh, from logging. And you can see, you know, in this case, we don't even have to paint lines on the map to show you where his land is. It's actually defined by this border and this border and this border and this border. Um, this is all basically logging and um, agriculture. Uh, his life's been threatened, um, but he's using technology. In fact, a group of Googlers went down there last summer to help train he and some of his staff. Uh, they're using GPS units to map out their borders. Uh, they use it to monitor all of their resources, uh, and then he's using tools like Google Earth not only to look at his own land and better understand what's happening there, but also then to communicate out to the world, hey, keep your eye on this plot of land because I'm trying to keep the loggers out, and if you see something other than that happening here, it's, it's not something that we want happening. Uh, so it's that sort of global kind of involvement and oversight role that I think is, is also really powerful. So um, I'll just cut to this final example, uh, you know, I, I kind of see Google Earth e evolving into something that um, we might, might call a kind of dashboard for the planet. So we can see certainly many, many point examples of things that are happening. We can become aware of them and hopefully become motivated to do something about them. We can also pull back and get the big picture. So as this progresses through um, the years here, out through the end of the 21st century, uh, it's going to load this climate change um, visualization. Um, but this allows us to see, you know, what is happening to the planet um, in a very, you know, visual, visceral way. And, I mean, this is something that can go out to hundreds of millions of people. And um, you can see, you know, in your corner of the world what's expected to happen. And in this particular layer, uh, they've pointed out, you know, in various places the very, you know, specific examples of what this temperature uh, change could potentially mean. Uh, potentially very devastating to agriculture, to coastal cities, and a number of other aspects of human life, um, as Dr. Lovelock will, will no doubt further explain to us. Uh, but in any case, that's where I'm coming from. I think there is a role for technology. I think um, it doesn't absolve us of, you know, we've got to act. We're the ones that have to change things. Uh, but technology does give us a way to wire ourselves together uh, in a way that has never been possible before. And the rate of change for these tools has been such that it's really hard to predict how powerful they're going to be in 10 years. Um, so, you know, with that, you know, I want to stand up and do something about it. And I think, you know, I think with these kind of tools, we can make a difference and hopefully get a handle on this. So, Thank you, you, John. Very impressive.